All right, this is a mini lecture five for weeks 14 and 15. And in this one, uh, very quickly, I'm going to go through the idea of understanding environmental change. And what I want you to do for your notes and for the exam is make sure that you can apply the concepts of extent, magnitude, and rate. Whenever we talk about environmental change, in other words, humans modifying their environment, the things that we need to think about is when we say that environmental degradation typically is happening, we want to understand that in terms of these three variables, extent, magnitude, and rate. Extent means how broad or over what, if you will, geographic area does the change occur. Change that is very localized. In other words, uh, I spray a pesticide in my lawn that would have very small extent. Uh, a contamination that goes through an entire ecosystem or through an entire marine system has a very large extent. Magnitude means the how big a change. In other words, if we say, does the pH of a river change by one point or by three? Does the amount of biomass, in other words, the amount of living things in an area, decrease just a little? In other words, we remove one, every, one of every hundred trees in a forest, or do we clear cut the forest? This is magnitude. And then lastly, we talk about rate. Rate means how quickly the change occurs. And again, we often think about rate because many systems can, if the change occurs slowly, the systems move or evolve to accommodate that change. So if we think about uh, historically, we can imagine something like the change from the last ice age. That slow warming for many organisms was they were able to migrate in terms of climate change. Some organisms couldn't. Some organisms could not evolve fast enough and they went extinct. So rates of change can be also very, very important. So let's take a look at these in some detail. Um, one example of an extent that can be quite large is what we call hypoxic or dead zones. And these are zones that we'll talk about a little bit later that are caused through eutrophication, and that is a change in uh, oxygen levels within an, uh, a marine environment. But what you'll notice here, these are areas where essentially there's not enough oxygen in the water for organisms to live. And what you'll notice is that these hypoxic zones, in terms of their extent, range more or less throughout the Atlantic coast of North America and throughout much of Western Europe. And so these are very large extents. We can talk about small localized extents in something called the Superfund sites. Superfund or SIRLIS, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, uh, long term, that simply means these are locations where a small area has a really, really bad environmental problem. And so let me bring up the map here. Um, these are the Surlis sites, the Superfund sites. And if I were to look at us, um, what you might see in Pennsylvania, now again, you'll notice that these are small locations. So these are localized, their extent's very small, but in some of these cases, they're really quite significant. So if I click on one, uh, this happens to be, uh, in this case, uh, Let's see, what do we have here? Uh, that one, I'm going to pick a different one in our, our area. Well, here's, here's ours. Um, this is in Grove City, Pennsylvania. And what we have here is the Osborne. This is a, the Osborne uh, landfill. And it's a fairly significant problem, but it's a localized problem. In other words, it's not. It doesn't extend over a large area. So Superfund sites can be quite bad, but they don't have a significant extent, okay? So next, we might want to talk about the idea then of localized extreme versus broad, perhaps somewhat subtle um, problems. And that gets us again to this issue of magnitude. So again, real serious problems, but very small or very broad problems in terms of their extents. And so this gets us to the question of magnitude. How far 
does the system move from, if you will, its normal state? And the important idea about this is what we call resilience. So imagine, if you will, uh, it's kind of a simple idea, but imagine a ball in a little trough. And if I push this ball up a little bit, it's going to roll back down to its normal state. And that might be the example of magnitude in a stream. In other words, if I add a little bit of something acidic to the stream, very quickly the stream's going to equilibrate, come back to its normal state. Doesn't make much difference. A little bit, a little bit of something acidic, a little bit of something basic, and it, it kind of comes back pretty quickly. And um, that's actually what we call a dilution scenario. But if I push that system far enough, if I add enough acid to that system, and that's what happens oftentimes with mining uh, of coal, we've changed the acidity of runoff to such a degree that iron becomes mobile. And what you will see once it comes out of solution is something that's very common in Pennsylvania are these streams with, a, with iron oxide all over the base of them. So we so fundamentally changed the system that now imagine again the ball, if you will, is the stream is now at a new state, a degraded state, and there's no way that this ball is going to be pushed all the way back up to here. That system has now reached a new equilibrium state that is significantly more degraded. So when we talk about magnitude, it's a question of whether we're pushing a system beyond its resilience point, its ability to recover, and now we're into a degraded state. And so some systems are very resilient to change. Others are really quite sensitive to it. Okay, so magnitude. Here's an example of one of those extreme scenarios of magnitude. Um, the King Mine um, was a, a gold mining area in Colorado. And in this scenario, in 2015, the King Mine, uh, cyanide and other heavy metals breached a containment dam and essentially sterilized a large portion of the river below it. And again, the reality there is that there's no, we've now pushed the magnitude is so great that the river, until sediments over, over, over many hundreds, if not thousands of years, until sediments bury those heavy metals, that river has been fundamentally altered. A uh, similar thing happened, unfortunately, this is this, these kind of terrible examples um, of magnitudes of change. Uh, the Weimar spill that happened in Romania uh, was a cyanide spill, and that essentially sterilized the river. The magnitude of that spill was so, the concentration was so high that what we saw was essentially a significant stretch of the river has been sterilized and remains sterilized because the cyanide is heavy, it falls out, and it remains part of the bed of that stream. So those are magnitude changes. Now, rate is, again, and, and if we look back at my examples now, uh, an example of a rate is something like that in a stream. In other words, all streams contain trace amounts of heavy metals. And if those are added slowly in small amounts, they tend to become part of the sediment low sediment, and they get incorporated and buried. But if we introduce a massive amount overnight, that's a rapid rate of change. And oftentimes systems cannot tolerate that. So for example, between 1970 and 2018, the northern part of the globe experienced in some areas as much as a three degrees Celsius change in its average annual temperature. Now again, that doesn't sound like a lot to you, but that's a very rapid change in temperature. And it also has an extremely broad extent. It is, by climate standards, a fairly big magnitude. So all three. Okay. We can also look at magnitude here. In other words, this is in terms of CO2 concentration. The Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii records uh, atmospheric CO2. And essentially between 1960 and 2020, what we see is almost a doubling of the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So given that, what we can then say is that this is a very, very rapid rate of change, and that's a concern. Now, it also requires us, though, to look at these things in terms of scale. And so again, the world's getting warmer. Um, the, you know, the, that's no longer really debated, um, at least in terms of 
the, the last 200 years, it's very clear that average global temperatures are going up. And they're going up quite a bit. And so the magnitude and the rate are fairly fast. When we look at scale, though, it's important to see this in terms of how people say, well, the Earth's changed temperature throughout its history. And that is absolutely true. And in fact, let's again, let's put all the pieces together. The magnitude of change, and again, this is global, so its extent is as big as it can be. Um, if we go back half a billion years, the magnitudes of change were extreme. Okay, but this is over 400 million years. And one of these spikes from this high point to this low point is over 100 million years. So its rate is really quite slow. If we look at, kind of we begin to move even further, we can take this next change, again, a fairly substantial, this is a big magnitude change, but again, it took roughly 50 million years. Now, I want you to kind of focus on this amount of change. So we've seen from here to here, and that's over about a 20 million year, 15 million year period. Now, I'm going to go forward, and again, you'll notice the time scale compresses as we go this way. If we look right here to right here, that level of change is equivalent to the level of change from here to here. This has happened. This, again, if we look at this, took about uh, almost 20 million years. This has taken 200 years. That is a rate that is not something that a system can respond to easily. And so there are consequences to that. So remember, extent, magnitude, and rate. We'll see you in the next lecture.